A city ruled by fear. Images or voices from Raqqa are almost entirely controlled by so-called Islamic State. People are seen carrying a, you know, a camera or a, a, a phone. They're huge risks. But there are some activists risking their lives to defy the terrorists. They are trying to counter a warped ideology that is pressed upon children. They make them like a bomb, a time bomb. And tell the real story of life inside the city. We decided that we will not stop until they will kill all of us. There is a resistance movement in the heart of Islamic State. In March 2012, President Bashar al-Assad faced demonstrations in what he had considered to be one of his most loyal cities. The Syrian revolution was a year old and Raqqa was rising. In response, Assad's troops fired live rounds on the protesters. Civilian journalists were already taking risks in Raqqa before Islamic State arrived, documenting the regime's atrocities. It would take another year before Raqqa would become the first provincial city to fall out of regime control. But then came the fight for who would control it. These images from August 2013 show a fairly normal, bustling city now under the authority of the Free Syrian Army. But that summer, Islamic State set up their own headquarters in Raqqa. And by January 2014, enough of their fighters had amassed for them to take over the city. They came to my house, they break into the house looking for me. Fortunately, I was not in the house. And when I talked with my family, they told me to escape because they, are looking for, they were looking for me. As a known activist who sympathized with the FSA, Abdulaziz was in danger. So he used fake documents to escape to Turkey, where he met Samad al Jilain, And together with three other activists who'd fled Raqqa, they set up a network for distributing information from contacts who were still inside the city. People were saying that Raqqa was the capital of Daesh. We wanted to prove them wrong. We wanted to prove them wrong and show the world what they were doing. Raqqa is being slaughtered silently, says the note. That's become the group's name. And Samad has given us some of their latest footage from inside the black cladded IS capital. Black covers what was a revolutionary flag on this monument. Here, an Armenian Catholic church has been turned into an IS administration centre. This IS communications tower has been bombed by the coalition. And with this footage come stories of life in the IS-held city. In 2014, Sky News first made contact with a member of the group. We disguised his voice and changed his name to protect him and his family. Abu told us how children were being lured away from friends and family. For the young children between 16 to 18, OK, we will give you money if you, if you say who are talking about us. There is a, a camping for under 16 for the children. They took a lot of children without even knowing their families. They make them like a bomb, 
This footage, too distressing to show in full, shows children pretending to be executed. They laugh afterwards. But they're being prepared for the barbarity of Daesh's war. It seems no child is too young for this kind of training. There are a lot of suicide bombers that Daesh have orchestrated, as well as brainwashing the children, they place them on the front line of battles. And if they are killed, it's considered they have protected the lives of Daesh by putting children on the front line. These desperate children are easy pickings for the terrorists. But the activists are trying to counter the extremist ideology. We have a magazine, we spread it inside the city, it's called Dab. Our magazine cover is the same cover of ISIS magazine. So when we spread it in the, in the street, in the city, even ISIS fighters, ISIS members, they, they thought that it's their own magazine. When they will open it, they will find our idea, our materials. And by this magazine, we are, we are trying to focus on children. Right now, we are not only fighting ISIS, we are fighting the ideology of the extremism, the ideology of ISIS. Gosh. As well as the magazines, they put up posters and spray graffiti. It takes courage to write this on the walls of Raqqa. No to IS, it says. This is the resistance movement in the heart of Islamic State. but it's extremely dangerous. In May 2014, Al-Mutaz Ibrahim was captured and killed after he was discovered with the group's logo in a file on his laptop. In December last year, another activist, Ahmed al Musa, was killed in Idlib, but neither of them gave away the names of other members inside the city. 17 activists remain filming under the noses of Daesh. This IS patrol car brushing past one of them. They're huge risks. I mean, people, if people are seen carrying a, you know, a camera or a, a, a phone where they might be taking pictures, the, the internet um, shops, cafes are completely controlled by Islamic State and there were very tight penalties on what um, people um, can get up to. So their risks are huge. But even for those activists outside of Syria, IS found a way of getting to them. Last October, co-founder Ibrahim Abdul Qadir was assassinated in southern Turkey. And in December, filmmaker Naji Jerf was shot by an alleged IS hitman again while he was in Turkey. He was a father figure to the group. For Abdul Aziz, who'd managed to flee to Berlin, this came as a shock. Actually, I didn't feel any fear only after they killed Naji. For me, it was really a normal thing. I knew that I'll be killed soon. I knew I'm, I got out of threat and I don't know when I'll be killed. After what happened with Naji, I felt that I lost some part. I, and after, it, they knew how to target us. Samad had been with Naji half an hour before he was killed. He's now the only group member left in Turkey. Daesh was able to find their way into Afra and the borders of Turkey. We were trying to convince ourselves that it would be impossible for them to do anything within the borders of Turkey, but they were able to reach it through, which is upsetting. What we lost is any hope for safety. It feels like we are still in Raqqa. Brutality is a part of daily life in Raqqa. There is a lot of executions, secret executions and public executions, especially after the Friday summons. There is a lot of them. Executions, crucifying, beheaded and like that. So the people see a lot of executions in the city of Raqqa. Here, a Daesh fighter describes Raqqa as a paradise. But footage captured by the group Raqqa is being slaughtered silently tells a different story. 
queues for food outside soup kitchens. And this is what they're waiting for. There's very little work for people here, especially those who refuse to join the terrorist group. After two years, more than a million civilians are still living under ISIS control and they didn't join ISIS. So you will find the doctors, the lawyers or whatever without any work, without anything to earn money. And if they want to work, they should join ISIS. More than a million who didn't join it's kind of resistance because they can't say anything against ISIS because if they will do, they will be executed. The group has filmed some of those executions, decapitated bodies left out for their loved ones to find. The scene ahead is too distressing to show. It's clear life for most of Raqqa's population is a living hell. And what's more, they're being bombed. The activists say since the Russians entered the conflict, the airstrikes have become more perilous for civilians. The most of the civilians, they got killed by the Russian and the Syrian regime airstrike. And they don't care if any civilians will be killed. The international coalition target a point, like a vehicle. But the Russian strikes and the Assad regime is much more severe, targeting many buildings and large areas. In Aleppo, there are a lot of areas that are attacked by Russian planes and the regime, which forced the Free Syrian Army back and allows Daesh to come forward. Even if it is not intentional, these actions are helping Daesh. Of course, everyone in this conflict has an agenda. It might be seen as propaganda to suggest that Russian strikes kill more civilians than coalition strikes. But Amnesty International say activists across Syria are reporting this issue with the Russian attacks. Since they entered the fray at the end of September, we're looking at something like 1,500 civilian casualties. That's been at a pretty constant rate since the start, and we would say that they have often targeted, whether directly or indiscriminately, civilian areas, including markets, hospitals, other residential areas. This is the Al-Makas checkpoint leading into Raqqa. Without these activists, the city would be cut off from the eyes of the world. They give us a snapshot of life, snippets of information. For example, that metres from here in Clock Square is where Jihadi John was killed by a drone strike. But this information comes at a cost. Now they are trying to target one of our members. They started by killing his father, then his father, his brother-in-law, then his another brother in Idlib. And all of us, we decided that we will not stop until they will kill all of us or when we will back home. It's the kind of defiant attitude that led civilians in Raqqa of all faiths to try and resurrect a church cross pulled down by ISIS when they first came to the city. But for many civilians, they wait in silence and with hope.